Boom. All right. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smithy with another GSD Mode podcast interview. And today, I got a long time good friend yeah. here on the podcast. Elliot, what's up, brother? What is up, my man? Yeah, dude. So excited to be here with you. Yeah, me, dude, me too, man. We, I know we've been trying to uh, make this happen for some time, man. That's you overdue. Know, we're trying it's to connect and, and had some scheduling conflicts between the two of us before yep. I stopped the podcast. And I went through like a six month <laughs> phase where I just shut everything down. And, you know, but as I'm launching, I'm like, man, we got to make this happen. Um, uh, not only have we been longtime friends in the industry, um, but uh, man, you guys have created uh, a, a new investment platform that has really, you know, helped not, not just, it's, it's allowed, been a big player in allowing my real estate team to continue thriving here during these changing times. You know, I mean, I look at since the start of COVID, you know, my, my business grew about 40 million in 20, uh, from between 2020 to 2021. And then in 2021, we grew yep. about another 49 million from 2020. Um, and if I look at what was the difference makers, I mean, it was products like yours, you know, partnering, you know, with companies like yours that allowed us to go out there and offer different things for our clientele and our market that our competitors couldn't. And I know all that we'll get into, man, um, uh, cause I'm really excited about, you know, yeah. sharing your journey, your story, but, um, why don't you just give us a little break down, uh, breakdown dude of, you know, who you are, how long you've been in the market and, and kind of what your background has been in real estate, you know, um, uh, like pre Zudilio. Yeah. So yeah, my name is Elliot. Um, I've been in the real estate game now, actually I'm about to celebrate my 15 year anniversary. So we've been through that, that grind. And I mean, that's, you know, how our wires, I mean, paths cross differently, uh, back in the day, right. Short sales, REO, all of those types of things. And so, uh, been through, been through those, those changing times and created a lot of system process, uh, you know, around the business innovated during those times. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a father, father of three, three kids. Um, I guess, you know, kind of a, you know, an entrepreneur definitely in the space. And, you know, that's the, I think that's one of the things I love about the real estate game is there is a never ending opportunity to, to create some just really cool things because, you know, the agent demand is just really, really huge. And being able to, you know, service agents, work with agents on, on a scale, like, you know, again, I, I achieved doing that in that short sale capacity. And, you know, we've now achieved this again, especially with this, you know, immersion of, in, you know, instant buyers, institutional buyers, um, you know, that are out there, the agents, you know, a lot of times see them as, as threats, quite frankly, right? we, we encourage the, you know, actually, um, like you see the opportunity that they bring, uh, to the marketplace because it has been the most compelling offer or, uh, compelling lead generation piece of things that we've ever seen in the industry to get homeowners, uh, to raise their hand. And now we have the immersion of this whole power buying concept, right? Turning your buyer's offers to cash is how you're getting these buyers to raise their hand in a whole new way there. So it's, you know, just, really cool um, to be a part of this journey and, you know, kind of bring, help bring one of these platforms to place to, to work with agents. Yeah. So, so if you've been in this game 15 years, that means that you jumped, you jumped in what, 2007, roughly? Uh, 2000, 2000, and I don't, maybe my math is off, but 2000, June, 2006 is actually when, okay, I, was, okay. when I was active. Yeah. So my, my right. I'm terrible old, at math in my head. Um, and it actually would be six. No, my, I'm terrible at math. I, it is 16 years. It's going to be my 16th year anniversary. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so, so you jumped in before the market just fell off a cliff here. Cause I was 2005. Yeah. I jump in, you jump in 2006, about a year apart. Um, yep. you know, w w it, it, and I think that this will kind of set the stage for everything you're doing now, because you're a guy that you and I kind of both out of the gate were forced to start adapting immediately yep. up in the business. Immediately. You know, what, what, what did you do? Like, cause 2000, from 2006, when you jump in, you know, 2007, we started seeing some insane shifts and then 2008, it was like, holy shit, everything had fallen off the cliff. So I actually, when I very first got in the business, um, you know, I'm a, I'm an ex sports guy. I had some good contacts at the time. And I had a, a uh, another friend of mine who we became friends, business partners. Um, we had actually started working for some smaller new home builders, right? They were doing custom stuff and how we actually fell into the, the short sale game was, you know, they were doing a lot of rolling money. A lot of them did not have, you know, crazy capital. They were doing, you know, drawing from one loan to the next to finish the next one. And they were kind of, they, they, as I like to put it, they ran out of, uh, they ran out of money before they ran out of month. Right. And so when, um, 
you know, before too long, we, we eventually had to solve these problems for them because they couldn't finish. And next thing you know, we couldn't sell the house for what they were even into it for. So like some of the first, you know, short sales that we ever did in the, back in the day in that circumstance is, is we were actually writing the own, our own addendums before, you know, any of that came out. And um, that, that it actually led to, it, you know, it being a huge opportunity, you know, where we ended up, you know, getting to the capacity where we were doing hundreds of them, you know, in a, in a given year, we were processing over 200 of them at any given time. And so it was just, you know, again, it really allowed you to, to build an assembly line. It was one of those things where you kind of back into it and fail, uh, failed forward ultimately. And, you know, it was, again, I think meeting the market where it was at. Right. They, they, there was a, there was a demand um, for something like that at that time. And so we created a very, a very cool system. And then of course, we all know what happened and how long it took to get through all of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I mean, it, it, it's it's essential to adapt, you know, and, and he, you know, I was just having a conversation with a good buddy of mine just about an hour ago, an hour before we hit the record on this podcast. And, you know, we were talking about I was, I was having that conversation around so many people have this massive resistance to change, even though it's the only thing that's always been and always will be is constant <laughs> change. And, you know, um, uh, and look, you, you change, you adapted, not, not yep. because you saw an opportunity. I mean, you saw an opportunity, but it was also, Hey, this is where the market's going. And you had to do that to service the, the business that, you know, you were servicing. Um, uh, then from there, when you were when you were managing those short sales, was this something that was just an in-house operation that you're going out there marketing your own short sales, or were you guys? Because I can't remember. Um, I know we knew each other at that time, but I can't. Yeah. Were you also taking on other yep. like, negotiating other agents' short sales? Yep. So yeah, we grew it to the point to where yes, I got it. You know where I think in like our height, I was running 50, 60, 70 of our own. Um, however, at that particular point, that's where we just saw the bigger picture. And I had actually created some, some, uh, joint ventures with title companies, uh, back in the day where they, you know, the marketing reps would be able to use a company that we had created called shortwayout.com to, um, you know, ultimately funnel in and we serviced short sales for that at that, um, you know, at scale. So like, again, those of people listening out there, when you used to work with title companies and they would facilitate short sales for them. My, my company was one of those companies behind the scenes making those things happen. Yeah, love it. So then, um, all right, so it was around 2012, 2013. You know, it's like our market bottomed out. We started seeing less short sales, less REOs, yep. but then we started seeing all these investors and institutions and invitation yep. homes and, you know, um, and, you know, traditional business sort of picking back up, you know, because the market had bottomed out, you know, um, and so forth. What, what, how did you adapt after that point? Like what was so the next ironically, um, you know, I had gone on, opened up my own brokerage, um, you know, dealt with a lot of things like that. And the, the crazy thing is, is I think why this is such a actually important and relevant to, to even today is I, you know, we all used to get a lot of short sales that would, um, you know, have a, a list pendants, um, trustee sale, right. That was going to come up that you a lot of times needed to stop that foreclosure or something happened to delay it. And the number one way to do that was to have a cash offer or an offer on the property. So we would, um, one of the investors that I had worked with, you know, back at this particular time to be able to get an offer actually hit me up because, you know, it'd been years, um, you know, one hand came back to, to wash the other. And he says, Hey, I got a lot of these, you know, turndowns from cash offers I'm making on houses that I can't um, I can't work with, but you know, if, if I give them to you to, and your sales team and you end up turning it into business, would you be willing to pay me a referral fee? And I was like, well, of course. Right. And so, you know, this is like 2014 ish, I would say, um, 13, 14 ish. And that was also around the time, again, being a, a broke, uh, uh, that we were in the brokerage and I had, um, uh, was working, um, you know, just having a nice little boutique brokerage that had decent production, et cetera. I got invited to this new company that was coming to here in the Phoenix Metro. And it was a, you know, a hedge fund company that wanted to buy properties and whatnot. And they had this whole new way that they were going to go about it. And, you know, this, this company ends up being, you know, they're new. They got, I think, $9 million of funding that they were going to deploy and buy in the market. That was direct acquisition, et cetera. And I leave, I remember leaving this meeting like, huh, I don't know what's so special about them, but that company ended up being open door. 
So that was kind of a, 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 a funny thing looking back on it and being a part of that whole, you know, what was new, what emerged into the marketplace as they were meeting with other brokers, team producers, and whatever else that they wanted to, you know, buy properties and et cetera. And so anyway, what I, what was curious about that, the, the list of information before is I would literally get these lists of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people that wanted a cash offer on their house. I had hired a, or had a dialing team. I gave it to my dialing team to, you know, kind of go out there. They would set appointments. We would go to the property. And what I found curious at that particular time is how many people um, would initially not want to talk about listing their house until you gave them a cash offer option. Once I gave them the cash offer option compared to next, uh, compared to what they could sell their house for on the open market, then they would talk about the open market in comparison. You know, that's when that days on market and that selling strategy came in, it came into play versus, Hey, here's my cash offer option. And so that was another thing, quite frankly, that, you know, that's led to a lot of these models that we, that we run today. And now, you know, helping us work with more than 3000 agents across the country. Um, you know, that was the immersion of, of some of these strategies. And it was just like being, you know, a light bulb goes off to where you start seeing a true consumer uh, behavior shift because they're looking for that, that instant solution, right? Just like one of the things we talk about, um, you know, again, I wish this was something that I came up with. I don't remember exactly who came up with it. I know a lot of the CEOs of, you know, um, Open Door uses it, Eric Wu, um, Rich Barton, you know, uses it. And they all talk about the, the three C's, right? It's the certainty, convenience, and cost. And today's consumer is looking for a, the best blend of the three C's, right? And simply put, if you put it a scale on zero to 10 in every single one of those things, the market supplies um, next to zero on certainty and convenience. It may supply a 10 right now on cost, but when you go through a lot of these acquisition strategies that they supply, um, you know, whether it's something that they do, some of these institutions that, that we work with, you know, some of our proprietary products that we provide, it gives the per person ultimate convenience, right? It's next to a 10, 9, 10 out of convenience. And it's a 9, 10 out of certainty. And even though the cost, you know, let's just say in certain circumstances, you know, go off of more of a, a normal circumstance, maybe that cost compared to the market is an eight, but that's still a score of 27, 28, or, you know, 27, 29 versus a, you know, 10, 12 that the market would provide in that circumstance. And so when you jump into the psychology of today's consumer, that's looking for the best balance of those particular three areas, that's, it become, becomes pretty telling. And I think that that's where it's so important for us as agents to be able to lead with a value proposition like this and give that homeowner those different, you know, selling solutions. That's not maybe just the cash offer, right? We all know the cash offer doesn't have the allure that it once did. It's now, how do we give them the certainty and convenience of cash, but still even give them an upside, uh, you know, upside of the market, right? To maximize their greatest asset. Yeah. Yeah. And, and dude, I was so excited when you guys came out, which we'll get into, you know, what your guys vision is and, and, and why and how you're different. Um, yep. uh, but the reality is, and you mentioned open door and I'll, I'll talk about this publicly. Cause I, I don't, I mean, I'm not a fan of open door. I'm not a fan of when, when I say that, I mean, we've done some business with open door. Yep. Um, they're, they're massive in our market. We're kind of the, yep. you know, you're in the Phoenix market. I'm in the Phoenix market with a testing ground for all of these, but I look at them as no different than a Zillow, you know, right. Of, of, okay. Like we funded Zillow, meaning the agent community. Um, we built them in this Definitely 15 billion plus dollar market cap juggernaut, you know, and, and I'm sure it's even way beyond that. I think that was last time I checked the market cap. That was, after. that's, that's their beat up market cap. Yeah. That's their beat up market, market cap, cap recently, right? Um, and we all know, I mean, who knows what they'd sell for 40, but who knows what, yeah. regardless of what it is, you know, but we, we, we were the ones that gave them money, the data, the Intel, the money. Um, and then, you know, to a point where they grow into this, this monster, and then they slit our fucking throats. Yeah. You know, right. So, so we, yep. you know, we, we have to wake up as people and, and as an industry of how many different enemies are we going to fund and, and, and create and, and allow them then to slit our throats, e even yep. though we might sacrifice. Like, dude, I had a buddy, um, not, not a buddy, but a guy that I had on this podcast, a dude that I know um, um, from the podcast who he was the number one rated 
Zillow agent, meaning like over 2000 and some five-star reviews. Well, when they switched models, like they are in our market to no longer a paid model, but a referral mar- oh, uh, model okay. overnight, all his reviews gone, everything gone, know. you know, uh, um, uh, in, in, okay. Like open door, dude, like they are in your red fins of the world. And all of these fucking companies are doing everything that they can to get to a point to eliminate us as the real estate agent. And it's just the reality of it. And, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't have competition and so forth and whatever, you know, but we also have to have awareness of like, like who are our friends and who are our enemies. And, if and, we, and, you know, in the beginning it was like, Hey, we didn't really have any friends. We, we didn't okay. have a friend until Zud- I mean, Zudilio is the only friend for us is the, you know, we, we've seen some of these massive brokerages like a Keller Williams come out with their own iBuyer yeah. product, you know, but I'm, I'm talking about uh, for the real estate community as a whole, we didn't have a friend in this space until you guys came out. And I saw what you guys are doing because you're agent only, man, like the general public yep. can't get to you Correct. It's only through the agent and you allow yep. us a tool to be competitive. Um, and, you know, I've been blessed because I was kind of the beta team, you know, to beta yep. you guys out yep. here in Arizona. So we've been able to see the power that you guys bring. Um, um, but it's, it's amazing, dude. And so I just wanted to share that because I think for all of our listeners out there, those are watching and listening is again, like we, we gotta, we gotta wake up. And, and when I say, I hate that term, wake up, you know, cause I don't want to say that people are asleep. It's we get busy in our lives, you know, right. but I think that we can all, we'll all admit that, uh, uh, what we did with Zillow and, and, and AR was in that bucket as well with us, you know, but we all allowed it to happen. And, and how many more, you know, we open doors there too. And I'm guilty of that too, you know, yep. as much as anybody, you know, but at some point it's like, all right, like we got to kind of pick, pick and choose what game we're going to play here for the long time betterment of, of our industry. Um, and, uh, um, I think that that's important for our industry to know. So I just wanted to say it. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't think wake up. I mean, I understand totally where you're coming from, but it, I, it's not even, it's not even as it, that, right. I think it's a, us realizing that there's a better way to do it. Right. And if you have the ability to give somebody, you know, what they're looking for now, and, you know, complete a transaction that makes sense for them and their family, right? There's so many, we all know, I mean, right? Like there's uh, umpteen studies and, you know, that have been done where people don't like to go through the process of getting their house ready to sell. They don't like to have the life disruption of people, you know, having the revolving door, um, you know, for the, what, depending on what market you're in, the five hours or five weeks that it's going to take to sell your house. Right. Regardless of it, even if it's that five hours, sometimes they don't like to go through that process. And what I'm ultimately getting at is, is when you have, um, you know, the ability to invite people into your digital living room to raise their hand like never before, because they can, you were providing them a solution that they can only get through you as their agent. That is extremely powerful stuff. Right. And that's what we're after. So you know, it's like one of the, the, one of the things that's so unique on this journey that we've been on and, you know, having all these different hedge funds and um, capital providers that, that we work with, it's been so unique is watching them come to us because of the, actually the power of the agent, right? A lot of people think that, oh, these institutions are done with agents. They think that they're trash and garbage. I, actually, quite the contrary. They realize the power of 1.6 million real estate agents, right? There's that, that speaks volumes. And when you have a platform that gives them the gateway and then they can communicate and then that gateway then communicates with the real estate agent, it's a win-win philosophy, right? So you have so many of these hedge fund representatives in your local market that they do 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 transactions a year. It's like an REO, it was like an, you know, a, 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 a primed REO account, right? Well, we are giving you that same type of access to be able to bring these deals to these types of institutions that they will take them down. If it fits, it fits. And so, you know, again, we can, we can chat on that in just a second. We've obviously created some, you know, I like to refer to as, you know, flagship products that you can literally only get through, through Zudilio. But yeah, I mean, that's part of what this mission is, is quite frankly, meeting the consumer where they're at, working with, you know, um, talented real estate professionals, teams, brokerages, and empowering them with a technology that's going to allow them to provide a better experience for their buyers and their sellers. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I, I love your voicemail, you know, whenever I call you and get your voicemail of, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, that you guys are the company that brings allows every agent to be an eye buyer. buyer. And, and, yep. and that that's what I think that, you know, really just wrapping that our heads around is 
you know, because I look at this always as, and, and maybe it's different for us in our market here in Phoenix, Arizona, because I do talk to some agents that are maybe in, I don't know, Southern Indiana or Kentucky or, you know, in certain markets that, that they don't have all these institutions yet that are in their market. Yep. But dude, your Blackstones and your Black Rocks are not slowing down. And who do you think funds, you know, your your <laughs> invitation homes, who, who funds yep. Zillow, you know, right? Um, yeah. uh, and, and so forth. You know, they're, they're not slowing down. They're just going to keep expanding throughout into, into market. So we, we got to be able to go out there and compete. I mean, how, how else do we compete? Um you know, w- without platforms like this, but you guys have even taken a step further. And and just to put some context to this, you know, one of my ideal clients throughout my whole entire career has been move up buyers. You know, they, they, yep. hey, man, they're, they're in a 1300 square foot house, three bed, two bath. They've been in there five to seven years. They got two kids. Yep. They're bursting out of the seams. They need, they want to move up to the 2,500 square foot house, but they need, and they got great equity, but they need to sell this house and it's got to be contingent yep. for them to go buy this next one. Well, dude, and, and since we had this whole COVID catapult market crash yeah. and that just this crazy fucking ride that we've all been on, though they became obsolete because nobody would accept a contingency. Well, right. you guys have a, a you know a, a unique program that came in and, and just yep. allowed you know the consumer. It's not just about giving us tools as, as real estate professionals. I mean, this is why I'm just you know why I love your guys' mission. Yep. And, product so much is it's not only giving me a product to, is a competitive advantage um, against other institutions and even my own competitors, but also it's providing products out there for the consumer that would be obsolete in this game I, with, without it. You know, without the sell plus, there are so many people that would be completely obsolete from having the opportunity to go out there and buy up. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think, you know, and again, just kind of, again, giving it a little context so people are listening, understanding, you know, what it is that we're talking about. You know, when you can lead with um, giving your client a cash offer um, at market value that when you list and resell it after we take ownership of it, and if it sells for more than we purchased it for, those proceeds go back to that homeowner. That's an extremely compelling offer to, to, to bring, right? And on the flip side of that, when they're buying the house that they're looking to buy, that you, can, that you are the gateway to turning their offer to cash that is, again, that's a heck of a lot better than saying, hey, here's my IDX link, go check out homes, right? <laughs> or here's my inside track. So it's just, that's also that you're also creating inside track with, with um, you know, access to inventory. Like I said, just when you really start looking at all of these things that, that really went through our, your, your partnership with Zudelio, our partnership with the agents, it's, it's, it's a really cool environment because we're solving so many problems, right? That's one of the cool, and you know, like, again, being an, an agent, I think, you know, first in a lot of this with, with you know, I'm one of four co-founders, um, you, you know, all of us were real estate agents first, right? Jason and Kayla were, you know, big in the REO space. Keith worked with me in the, in the short sale space, right? We all understood, um, I think, business at a core and really understanding the systems and processes, right? That was the one thing I will say in that era we all worked our asses off for very little money in, in comparison, right? But the one thing it taught us how to do is run a business, right? Because if you could not run a business, you could not survive in that particular era. And so that's why I think you see so many successful agents ultimately from that era. You, you know, I mean, we can list off several of them. Um, with that said, it's just like when you um, really ultimately can, can provide a solution right? What problem are you solving, right? Let's like, you know, tech jargon we like to refer to now is what problem are you solving? Well, when you're solving the contingency problem, um, if I move my, if I sell my house, great, great, I can sell it in two hours, but hey, do I have to move in with my in-laws? Do I have to go pay six grand and stay in an Airbnb? Do I have to move twice, right? None of those things exist in this environment that we've created. And when you are the gateway to that for your client, dude, a great value proposition yeah yeah so yeah. i mean and and again i mean that's like for for me and you know obviously being on the podcast it's not it's not here to like promote like hey this is the you know an offer i don't want it to be like a sales pitch i guess it part of my and i think you this is probably one of the reasons why you and i resonate and have for so long is it's not yes there's always a, there's always a sale right and, you know in certain things but it's also like 
what is the passion around what you're delivering, right? Are you, are you, are you serving? Right. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that, that I, that I love about myself and, and the, the three other co-founders is all of us are all, you know, after helping agents run their business more efficient, right? Because once upon a time, lead generating looked like cold calling, mailing, you know, then it grew to, you know, obviously pay-per-click and, you know, you, then you got some of that inbound stuff and you're putting a bunch of cash out there. But now we're, we're arriving to these, these new environments to where you can run behavior metrics on some of your marketing with these types of, um, you know, uh, UVPs, U, U, uh, unique value propositions. You're inviting people in like never before, and you're getting them to engage with you like never before. And so that's just a part from, for us as practitioners and, and as agents to be able to share that with our, our fellow agent community is humbling and awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you, you don't have to do the selling here cause I'm going to sell you for you, <laughs> you know, I mean, cause it's one of those things where, where to me it, again it is, and look, I've, I'm not an owner of Zudilio, but, but it is like, you guys are a platform that is, is I've been so excited for you guys to roll out into other markets. You know, I've had yeah. so many, cause as you know, I have a lot of coaching clients. I don't talk about it a ton here on the podcast, but I have a coaching program and in addition to podcasts and so forth. And you have so many of my coaching clients have been like, you know, just waiting and waiting and waiting for you guys to expand and been able to see what we're doing and, and the amount of value that it brings to, to, you know, my own business, yeah. um, which again, man, I have no vested interest in anybody buying your program. It's just that this is a platform that again, it not only allows us to be competitive against these large institutions at 100%. I know you're being a little PC about it, whether intentionally or not, you know, right. Or maybe you just, but for me, like I'll be bold, you know, bold about it. Cause it, it does. And, and look, I'm as guilty as anybody. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm ashamed of my past behaviors of, of allowing, um, of, of not making a bigger stand against these bigger institutions that 100% are trying to eliminate the real estate agent, which now Absolutely. I can see that so clearly. I, I won't be bashful there. about that. You know, and, 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 and look, yeah, I mean, a lot of these, invest, maybe some of these hedge funds understand the power of the, the, the realtor, but you look at the CEO, like, like, again, you look at CEO of Red, I mean, dude, fucking CEO Redfin's on public record. He tried to walk it back afterward, but yeah. on public record of, of saying that their, their primary objective is to eliminate the real estate agent or the buyer's agent, you know, the, right? Yeah, um, ten, yeah. You know, uh, uh, so, so, you know, giving us these tools to be competitive, um, making it exclusive only to real estate agents, yep. not allowing the consumer to be consumer facing. Cause okay, even if we go out there and team up with an open door and, and allow agents or go submit the consumers yep. properties to them after the fact, well, doing that ex offer expires in four or six months. You seriously think they're not going to be, you know, out there hitting that person up. Dude, you know, their marketing is insane. It, That's the one thing I will yeah. And it's why yeah. like, I hate sending a deal to Quicken. I mean, I'll do whatever's best for my clients, but like Quicken, you know, right. Like dude, as soon as they have their, their real estate professionals that they work yep. with, you know, right. As soon as you get a mortgage, you'd like, I have one of my properties with Quicken and dude, it's like almost like monthly. I get a mailer from them and then, you know, about why to sell or, you know, whatever, and then connecting me with their in-house person. So I could, as a real estate professional, send a client to this lender that does business with them. And then immediately they're trying to undercut me to their own real, you know, right. So, yep. so this, I mean, and, and they it, do the same thing. Yeah. It, it, it's a competitive landscape. I'm all about competition. Bring it on. I'm all about it. What I'm just saying is it's, it's, a, it's a awesome and amazing to have tools because I'm not going to go out there. I, you know, I don't have the money to become my own eye buyer. I don't have the, you know, maybe knowledge base or, or even the capacity, mental capacity and knowledge to go out there and get a hundred million dollar fund from another yeah. investor to run my own eye platform, nor do I want that to go that direction. Um, and so you guys allow that tool, but it's not only that is it tools for us as the, the real estate community to go out there and, and have that competitive advantage. Again, these are, cause I'm seeing it firsthand being in one of the most competitive real estate markets here in the United States right now um, okay. uh, of all these buyers and sellers that would be obsolete, that could not go out there and buy or sell, even though they need to in this market, that that would not be a possibility without you guys' product. So it's not just helping us as agents, it's helping a lot of families out there. So it, to me, it's like the ultimate win, win, win. So I will gladly sell you a product. All day oh, long thank you, man. I appreciate that. For all of us. And again, I'm not an owner and I'll shut up on that, but I, I, I know I'm getting kind of passionate here, but I just want all of our listeners and everybody to, to understand the power you know, of this. And 
How long have you guys been in other markets? Are you in all markets at this point? So we're in 47 different states that we could supply, um, you know, different offers on, right? So we, we have the ability to deliver, you know, the cash offer plus, which is the one that I told you where it gives you, you know, the cash net, you know, gives them that cash offer now. Uh, you know, if that agent sells it for more, they get that, those upside uh, proceeds. And then um, we have a sell and lease back the uh, offer that we do in conjunction with it, with a partner of ours. And, you know, what that does is it gives the agent the ability to bring a cash offer and actually allow the homeowner to lease their house back for up to 12 months, which is, you know, a really compelling offer. You do, you know, again, that removes contingencies, all of those types of things that are, that are there. And then of course, um, and also, um, 47, uh, markets, we can turn that buyer's offer, uh, to cash as well. So these are again, huge value propositions, but you know, part of one of the biggest things I think that, you know, I'm constantly talking about with, you know, brokers, team leaders across the country is, you know, I think agents make the mistake. And even we, you and I were even talking about this before we, before we press record is so many agents make the mistake of responding with this. When you want to know what these institutional buyers, I buyers, um, or I mean, I let's just say I buyers are so amazing at marketing this message. They lead with this message. And that's exactly why in a lot of the markets, some of the data right now is suggesting as much as 50% of the houses that are hitting the market that they're operating in are first starting off with that cash offer. Could you imagine what your business would look like if you got 50% of the houses that are hitting the market or you're getting a crack at? And that's why they've turned into brokerages. That's why they, they, they're, you know, they're, they're shifting in all this because the monetization of the lead is something that Zillow, that juggernaut that you talked about, is why they jumped into that particular space. And again, we'll see what happens with them. Again, I, I for one, think that they're going to pivot into the power buying space just because you know, they obviously have the capital to do it. It's a way safer bet to go in and buy a house in cash for somebody and sell it back to them 10 to 14 days later. Right. Not to mention, you know, with their mortgage company, they sell it, they're, they're Fannie Freddie direct, and then they sell it off. And then now they make a percentage of, of that interest rate for the life of that loan. Right. So there's a lot of monetization in the, in the, in these things that if you really look layers down that these juggernauts are going to continue to do that. And for us, again, speaking from the heart, us as practitioners, being that it is such a competitive landscape, if we don't have the systems and processes in place or not aligning with tools to deliver the value proposition that are going to run behavior metrics, you know, because there's also data that shows it's not the, it's not cash offer one, it's cash offer month five, six, or seven that they're choosing to do something or list their house. And if you don't have those things in place, you know, a, a dashboard, for example, that tells you, Hey, they're potentially wanting a new cash offer. You're missing the boat. And that's the type of stuff where you're going to, you know, get left behind. And those are the people that you're losing to open door. Those are the people that you're losing to, to Redfin, because guess who has those systems in place that we just spoke of? They do. And so that's where our mission is in, in our agent partners that we work with is to supply you with those types of, you know, those things. And the beauty of it is over half of these houses that come into, uh, or excuse me, over 90% of the houses that come into the platform end up listing the house on the market anyways, right? That's all them. And that's because the power of the market. And when you can show that homeowner a selling strategy, but yet you, your conversation started with a cash offer, no brainer, lead with it. So I know that was a bit of a long, you know, run on that, but I mean, that's how passionate I am with it around lead with it because it invites, it invites a conversation, um, that you, that you can have like never before. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. Yeah. And, and, um, one thing we didn't mention before is what's, what's cool, but what you guys do is you also provide the website for the agent to be yes. in his brand, the agent, but it's not like we got to go build out our own funnels to like, you provide the website and an offer portal with the, you know, it makes it, yep super easy for us. And then we don't have to go worry about websites and landing pages integrates with any CRM kind of a deal. That's and, right. You know um, so it makes it super, super simple. I mean, it, even with the offer platform, I look at this of like shit, like to me, that's so much value. Even, even if I didn't get some of these offers, you know, because you yep. have it in a way where you can stack multiple offers and organize right. it, which is kind of nice in this market versus some ugly Excel spreadsheet. You know? Yeah. Well, my, right. Well, it's just, I mean, let's speak it. Let's, let's, let's be real about it. Uh, tech now speaks volumes, right? I mean, we, we are all, when, 
when everything is, you know, now on this and we, and it's become the status quo that we have to have some type of interface with that the consumer is expecting, especially since, you know, COVID, right? Like that's only elevated the tech industry. And for us as practitioners to be able to deliver a compelling value proposition that spells out nicely, you know, on the phone, on their computer, I think again, is, is, is a must, especially for, for us true practitioners. Yeah. And in those watching and listening, I, I got some different directions. I'm going to take this podcast with, with Elliot. So, but I just want to let you guys know, if you scroll below, we'll have Elliot's contact info as far as if you want to check out more about Zudilio, that'll all be below where you guys can click on that anytime. Um, so dude, I mean, you and I talk a lot and we kind of, cause we're, we're been in this game for a long time. We're both really passionate about re- all things real estate, but we're also both, you know, really involved in the tech sector and, and so forth. You know, um, speaking from a tech standpoint, like, like what, what do you, it's so hard. I know this is such a loaded question of where you see this industry going, but you know, I mean, what, where do you see it going? You know, even like, let's just say a five-year outlook um, and, and, and how do real estate agents need to be prepared for, you know, cause it's like one of these, like people think of market shifts is, is in correction, like a, is a correction almost where it's like, no, look, dude, like COVID was a shift. It was a sh- big shift overnight and from face-to-face meetings to zoom meetings. And yep. there, there's going to be so many shifts that we have to make at such an exponential rate because of really because of technology. And there, there, I'm sure there may be some financial shifts that, that are thrown in the mix too, you know, but, but, you know, what's your, I don't know. What, what do you um, think? Well, what, I know we talked about this pretty, pretty, yeah, we talked about this quite a bit, I think a month or two months ago. And I, for one, think the institutionalization of real estate, especially when you, if you're looking at, you know, what, what's happening on a, um, you know, deed tax level, you know, you're seeing in, in a lot of major metropolitans that it's not, everybody wants to talk about the open doors, offer pads, Zillow's at the time. And I mean, when you, obviously when they're acquiring over 20,000 houses, you know, on a national level, on an annual basis, yes, it obviously hits people's radars. But I'm talking about the Blackstones. I'm talking about progress. I'm talking about, some, um, you know, an invitation homes, right? The immersion of some of these larger things. When you're seeing that they are accounting for about 10% roughly market share every single month on that. And it's these they're holding these houses for seven to 10 years, right? When you have rent schedules, especially with the equity boom hit the way that it hit the last two years, well, what happens? Of course, they're turning over. Rents are going to go up 10%, 15% in certain markets. And I think that when you when when we see this, and especially, again, going back into the psychology of things that we have, there's so much money, I believe, that's that's come into this that um, I, for one, obviously, we, we can't sustain the, the appreciation schedule that we have the last couple of years. But I mean, yes, I, you know, rates are obviously going to go up. Um, you know, and I, I do think that there's going to be some, some pressure on, you know, um, some pricing and those types of things that are, that are going to come out, but I actually think it's only going to drive this narrative that we're in even more. I, I genuinely do. And, um, I think it's going to present more opportunity and, you know, a lot of these, like, like, again, time will tell what Zillow does and maybe they press the eject button too fast. Maybe, you know, um, their lack of, you know, they always like to say, oh, our forecasting of pricing was what the issue was when it was, you know, I think for one, it wasn't just the other issues that they really dealt with was it wasn't just the supply issue of the actual product to upgrade the house. It was, they didn't have people to work on the house. Right. And it just, there were so many pieces of the, uh, of the, of their process that were broken and rich Barton, quite frankly, being the super genius dude that he is um through the brakes on it and so i think that that is going to that type of environment is going to continue to to exist i i could 100 percent see um more institutionalization around this power buying um especially where hey we're going to get you qualified you know from that and here's our pool of properties that we own um, like I said, I, I think it's, I think it's, it's a very interesting landscape. And I think that us as agents, um, are going to not only need to provide options around cash options, I think different selling solutions, right? I'm seeing a ton of this immersion of these auctions, um, pressure on commissions, pressure on, you know, just a, a lot of things. So I think it's it really for us as practitioners, that innovation is going to be as important as ever. 
And then just as far as in general, the, the, the state of our market, I, I for one think that inst the institutionalization of uh, real estate is, is for real and it's, and it's here to stay. And that when they ha when you have that type of capital, they control supply which of course, you know, directly relates to, to demand. And so that's, you know, that's the governing dynamics of everything, as we all know, is supply and demand. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more, dude. It's, it's the games change, man. It's either institution yeah. be affluent, you know, and, and, and when I say, or, I mean, talking about a combination of, of, of the both, um, but it, it's a game that, man, I don't know how we compete, dude. Um, uh, you know, when they're, they have direct lines with the fed, in, in you know, getting getting money for free at, at this this point and you know how do you go out there and compete is is your regular you know Jane and Joe man I mean I heard that uh, uh, in 2020 the average age of a first time buyer was 34 and 2021 I've heard now it's moved up to 37 I've been yeah. able to vet the 2020 I haven't been able to know with certainty whether 37 it wouldn't surprise me that if it's moved up to that though. But it's like, dude, like we're having the average. Let's just assume it didn't move to 37. It's 34. The average first time buyer now in the United States being 34 years old. I know. It's insane. Yeah. They're waiting longer. They're renting more. Right. I mean, and that's like I said, there's just when you really look at like the consumer trends, I, I think the writing is on the wall right there. Right. I mean, you know, this, this, you know, obviously Gen Y, Gen Z is, is, you know, and is they're now owning houses and that's changing things. Right. Like they're, they're holding on longer. And I mean, like I said, I've, I've, <laughs> I've had conversations with the team before where I could see like, it is almost like, you know, it's almost going to become like a, there, you're going to buy into a pool where people are going to become so transient that you can, Hey, I, I pay, I make a $500,000 mortgage payment, but I'm going to move, uh, you know, here's my places like, like almost like a Picasso, right? Like type thing, like, Hey, I can, I, I have a certain amount of time here. I have a certain amount of time here. I have a certain amount of time here. And I, my mortgage payment is always $500,000 but or based on $500,000, right, is what is what I'm saying. And so anyway, I just, uh, it, I think it's so interesting in, in these types of things. Um, and, you know, again, you start getting into these theories of, of things, I always, I always tiptoe in, in, in these in these circumstances, because uh, um, obviously being being a part of what we what we are with our institutions and our buyers, our private capital that we have involved, uh, you know, again, I try to leave it open. Yeah, yeah. I, and, 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 you know, I mean, if you look at it, though, um, and I know that, you know, this is, I'll, I'll go ahead and say this, you may or may not agree with it, you know, um, but, you know, you go out there and you look at the World Economic Forum, you know, which, man, I mean, you're, BlackRock is the biggest supporter, man, oh. you know, right, of, of, you know, um, and then and then it's like, okay, well, who, who owns Blackguard, who's the majority of Vanguard, we don't know who owns Vanguard per se, but it's, you know, as you start, but you look at World Economic Forum, man, the, the the Great Reset Agenda. Now, when I first heard about that, I just dismissed it as all conspiracy theory BS. But then you go on there, you know, Klaus Schwab. The uh, I just bought his book on Amazon, the, the Great Reset Agenda. You know, post like a post COVID world, written yep. by you know Klaus Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum, about that. You know, this whole Great Reset, and then this whole you'll you'll own nothing and be happy again. I would have dismissed this conspiracy theory. Then I go to World World right. Economic forums website and they have a great reset um uh, website element of the world economic forum they have a commercial that is exactly you'll own nothing and be happy and and maybe may, but again i don't i don't try to attach to ideologies of good bad i mean i don't know we'll see this may be a good thing man it, it may be a thing of because you start to look at it and, and i bought like i'm one of these freaks that maybe i'm just bored but i'll go watch all the davos meeting yep. videos and you know, um, but, it, you know, you start looking at, okay, well, when we all have self-driving Teslas, let's just say, you know, and it gets to the point where, okay, I can have my car drive me to the office, but then I can have it go work as its own Uber, you know, but then if there's all these, you know, self-driving, like, why do I need to own a car when I can why just, do I need one? Yeah. You know, but then it's less cars in the road, less damage, less pollution, you know, and you start to see with these Airbnbs and, and, you know, I, I mean, I can see it becoming a, uh, owning less, having necessarily less responsibilities, less debt, I'll but then happy. a little bit more freedom to go move around and do things. So I don't necessarily look at it all as a negative, you know, but it, it seems to be though that, I mean, because I, I think what, I've tried to break this down and, and pencil this out either way, whether we continue down this road of inflation, which if we, you know, appreciation inflation, if we continue down this road, 
institutions are, are really the only, you know, institutions influent are the only ones that can acquire real estate. Now, if the market crashes and we tank and we go down a deflationary route, you know, um, well, then my best guess is that these institutions, like your, your Fanny, Freddie HUD, do what HUD's been doing since 2013, packaging up some of the institutions. Yep. You know, so either way, I'm like, I think the result's the same, same. you know, yep. Wh- which means us, I think is really- They have a foolproof plan as much yeah, as I, I think us yeah, it's like they, they win either way. way. Yeah, I think we need to, to be responsible and, you know, uh, acquiring our own real estate as we can, you know, um, but then again, how, how do we, in a world like that, that's where programs like yours, dude, and uh, are, are so powerful is, you know, if I have somebody right now that needs down payment assistance, that, that needs closing costs. And this market, dude, they're not competitive, but I can put them into a Zudilio product. They now become a cash buyer, you know, yep. through guys' product. And yeah, they're paying a little, uh, a little blip on it. Mm-hmm. Cool. But, you know, because that's what I'll get people I'd be like, well, who wants to pay those fees? I'm like, dude, my, all my clients have done business, you know, that we put into a Zudilio product, if you will, or one of your products, I should say, that have helped them in their situation. They're ecstatic. They don't give a shit about yep. the extra few percent of fees that they had to pay here and there because they wouldn't have been able to purchase or sell without it you know so they're ecstatic because it otherwise they would have been obsolete in this market well and i mean yeah i mean and as you know in certain markets that become a cash buyer is actually you know free now which which some of the new things that we have lined up with that said in the other markets it's, a, it's one and a half percent now and when you really look at that logistically if you're a financed offer and you're and if it's a competitive landscape you're a lot of times having to uh, having to offer five percent maybe even ten percent over list price so how cheap did that fee just get at that point, right? That's one of the things I talk about. Yeah. Not to mention, I mean, it, it's the peace of mind. It's the lack of brain damage that you don't have to, to deal with because you have to go look at 100 houses, write 50 offers to get one accepted. Yeah. Now, when you mentioned a, little, a moment ago, you were talking about Zillow becoming a, a who'd you say, a power buyer? Power buyer. Yeah. What, what is, I'm not sure I'm familiar with that term. So a pow, power, buying, a power buying is when they buy the house in cash for you. And then they, okay. and then they, and then they replace, uh, they replace their cash with their financing. Okay. So, so you're saying that there, you see them moving to really just becoming their own actual lending institution and then they become, yeah, well, they already own a mortgage company, right? Yeah. So then they become the servicer. So it kind of be like, I'm, I don't know, like a Wells Fargo going out there yep. and, and buying the house for you, letting you be, you know, pay cash for you. And then just now yep. servicing. So the here, debt. Here's another crazy stat. And again, this came from Rich Barton, which I was really surprised that he put this out on the wire the way that he did. He said that Zillow <laughs> offers was 90% of their mortgage company leads, right? So that that's the power of, of, a, of a seller lead, right? And the data on it is, is um, over, what, it's over 60% of the people that are um, selling a house are going to buy a house in the same physical year, right? Highest quality leads again, right? And so like that, when you're looking at the, that type of, of data, you know, it's just, you know, the path is, is always math. And it's just, again, it's, it's a reverse engineering process from that. And again, that's what the, the, you see a lot of these guys that, that are at the, in these particular thing, in particular circumstances, just like we were talking around uh, before with funnels, right? It's, it's, it's an in and out circumstance. And that's the, that's the beauty of, of creating these, these larger scale, um, you know, type environments. And so when they can, you know, be able to offer, um, turning somebody's offer to, to, to cash, right? It's a, lo- it's a far less risk than taking on a property that you're now paying, you know, the, uh, you're taking on all the risk of ownership with a, without, a, without a, an in buyer, right? They already have the buyer when they buy the house, right? So this buyer, they already know that they have them fully qualified for the, the amount of house that they're acquiring for them. Right. So it's, 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 it's a beautiful philosophy, right? Like one of my biggest, you know, um, you want to know one of the things I will tell you that, that, um, that I do talk about and I, and I'm totally open on, on sharing. I think I can see, uh, one of the most powerful eye buyers coming out being, having us having a, a, an arm in servicing, right? Servicers make a ridiculous amount of money. And um, there's obviously a f- some nuances that have to go on in that particular circumstance. But if they can come on, buy the house, you know, uh, give the mortgage, then collect servicing, then ultimately sell it off. And then the beautiful thing about being a servicer is, is if you're Fannie Freddie Direct, obviously they usually, I think it's they need to sell it to them or sell it off within 60 days to them. Um, they actually get a small percentage of that interest rate for the life of the loan. And imagine doing that at scale. 
So I can see a world where, where a servicer of some sort comes in that has a servicing arm, right? Like, like, a, like an Amerifirst, right? Or a, an academy mortgage, somebody that has a, a big enough arm and a servicing department that services tens of thousands of homes, um, having an arm like that. I can see an, uh, an eye buying capacity come in in that because here's what would happen if that happens. They can literally pay cash for the house, have a 0% service fee because they make money everywhere else. Yeah. And that would be one hell of an offer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you look at like, I mean, how, much, how, much, how many single family cash homes is Blackstone on now? Dude, they're worth, they're like, I actually looked at their, their, their estimated valuation and they're worth like, it's like $500 billion. Yeah. They're worth a half a trillion. Right. And like, that's, that's their assets. It's, yeah. it's, it's absurd. So, so yeah, I mean, you look at a company like that that has at least 20,000 plus single family attached or just in the United States alone. Oh, more like 100,000. Well, I mean, because they, they sold off imitation homes. Oh, that's, uh, that's, that's true. Yeah, so I don't know. You, but you could be still right. I don't, uh, um, uh, but when you start looking at a company like that, it, it's, you know, like I look at them with, you know, the acquisition of home partners of America, you know, with all those people that now they're, those people are rent to purchase. And then when yep. they purchase, you know, then sell those back, but them being the bank at the same point, you know, yep. it, just, it all makes sense, dude. Yeah. I mean, it, it, when, like I said, when they can create a model where you, that's, that's based on almost like collecting payments, ultimately, that's what they're doing. And, and they do that at scale. It's, it's a, it's a really, um, it's a, it's a really interesting conversation. I mean, I don't want to go down like a, you know, rabbit hole too much here because again, I think ultimately, and I guess really what I would share with everybody that's listening in this is I know sometimes some of this stuff may sound like new concepts, but this is where, again, you asked me before, where's the, where's stuff going? It's, it's going down this, these more sophisticated paths, right? Where there's a, there's a ton of ways to make money. And these guys are making money, making money that we don't even know that they're making. Yeah, dude, I mean, I got, I got buddies of mine that are real estate brokerage owners in other markets that are, are, are converting their offices to virtual showing rooms. You bring in clients, you know, they, they put on the goggles and they're, instead of going out and driving in 200 homes, you know, um, now they've obviously had to go out there and shoot the three. So this might be on their own inventory, you know, but all that shit's coming, man. You look at the yeah. metaverse, you look at all of this stuff yeah. and it is going to come so much faster than we realize. You know, I know that uh, I got a buddy who, who you know, uh, know as well, Leo Pereja. Yeah. And I was talking with him and we were having lunch. This is about a year ago or maybe a little bit longer than that ago, but we were like, dude, there's been more changes in the last 12 months than the other 15 or 16 years of our oh. career at that point combined. And dude, this shit is coming down the pipe so damn fast, dude. Yeah. You know, so, so it's one of these things of have awareness and, and yeah, I mean, we don't know if this stuff's going to take place, but just having conversations about what ways it possibly could go allows you to prep and plan. You know, it's like, I have, I have, models that I've mapped out for, okay, if the commission compression comes heavy on real estate agents and yep. I got to go to a, a, a 1999, so a $2,000 or less flat yep. fee, um, dude, I have funnels mapped out, models mapped out where I can still easily net over a million a year as a team being a, you know, I can, I can scale my business and do very well under that model. Yep. Now I haven't pivoted that. I don't want to pivot to that, but I map out just in case, you know, like, like we got to sit there and think about, okay, what different routes could this go and then have continued. Yep plans so then we can pivot and adapt and shift and it's what you and i've had to do our whole careers to continue to to adapt shift and change and, and succeed well as i said before i think that that's a, a commission a commission compression is real and it's and it's and it's going to continue to happen um with that said i think that's one of the beauties of sometimes working with these institutions or whether it be you know something we provide or or, or a company that you work with right is that some of the cash offers that we make we uh, we empower that agent, right? We list that agent or hire that agent to list and sell that property, and we deduct that you know commission, um, you know amount to to repay that agent the commission that they deserve. So a, again, like it just a, a, the, those are those are really cool uh, you know offerings in that um, to be able to do. But you know one other thing I think that that you know since we're talking more futuristic things that, that is really something for us to pay attention to is. You know what is the level of vacancy is going to be, right? As we as all of this starts to go up, I think that we're going to start seeing you know vacancies potentially increase as as some of these institutions, you know, when they turn their properties and etc. 
um, you know, acquire the houses. And we all know the open door model, right? Is the open door, right? They can, they can scan and they, they get into the house. And now, I mean, you have Lennar that, you know, what they invested $200 million into open door a couple of years ago. Well, Lennar doesn't have a sales staff now, right? They took that concept and you can literally scan most of their models and get in there. I know that a lot of the agents that I work with in California, if the house is vacant, you can scan, get an access code, throw into your house and you can get in. Builders here locally are doing it all over the place, right? Because of the power of the camera, because of the power of, you know, now, hey, let me just scan this. Boom. I snag your information. I send you a code and now they're into their house, right? It's, so it's showing ultimate showing convenience, right? And I think a world that is coming and something, quite frankly, we're we're looking at striving to even build with through technology is being able to supply that uh, type of environment, right? So you're, you can scan, be in the house. Ultimately, you know, they, they now have these one click approvals, right? That, that, you know, that through big data is possible. So again, imagine a world where they can scan in a house, be standing in that house, get approved, literally submit an offer while they're standing in, the, in that house, be backing out of the driveway from checking in that house and getting a notification that you, that, that, that titles being opened, right? Because all of this is one seamless approach and, and, and experience. And Hey, here's the button to click and open up escrow, right? Like, I mean, it, it, so it's just like, like, if we think that this type of frictionless environment is not coming, we're kidding ourselves. And uh, that's where I think we, we become a part of this and really um, cheer on these types of, of, of things, because what this means for all of us is ultimately more transactions, right? That's to me, that's, that's why I'm so excited about these types of environments and to really be at the forefront and, and be a bit of a thought leader in some of these spaces is, is, is opportunity, right? Like, like it's, how do we make it smoother? How do we make it better? Yeah. And I, I think, you know, uh, so many real estate agents, and, and I mean, we're in this world, we're both realtors, so we can, you know, have these open conversations because we're classified in that bucket. But, and, and I'm a guilty, I've been there too, where, where you know, I've been guilty of this too, of, of making it about the real estate agent and the, the real estate agent industry, not about the consumer, you know, and, and if we as, as an industry would have been obsessed about the consumer, not saying that we aren't, but there maybe hasn't been enough focus on the consumer themselves absolutely you know, then the i buyers wouldn't have wouldn't have ever existed the way they they you know we ignored a certain you know element of of you know consumer need and want and demand and and somebody else saw it and moved in dude and you know i mean if we make this about the consumer and we're obsessed about the consumer um and not trying to protect that you know us as a realtor or industry um, then dude, like th this is all better for the consumer. And that's why competition is a great thing. You know, it's a pain in the ass to fucking have to buy a house. In the it, it, it is. Well, and I mean, when you think about it, right, like the, we overcomplicated something that just doesn't have to be that complicated, yeah. like bottom line. Yeah. Like, I mean, I under, we all understand. I mean, obviously the importance of home inspections, title reports, et cetera. Right. But there's just with with I mean, especially I mean, and again, not to go off on this, but, you know, now blockchain and, you know, all these other things that now exist that I could see those environments starting to come about, you know, in reference to title and all that type of stuff that it doesn't have to be that convoluted anymore. And when you look at all of that, these are there's the transaction becomes so bloated with fees, 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 fees. And again, it doesn't have to be that way. And that's what I think a lot of this technology that continues to come into the space is going to do. It's going to put pressure on these fees, put pressure on, you know, just everything, right? Because the consumer's looking for a, 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 a simpler, easy, you know, a, a more efficient, simple way to transact that doesn't cost them an arm and a leg, right? Like, you know, hey, if the price is this, but I'm pay paying this plus all these fees now. Why, why does it have to be that way? And I think that that's where we, we are creating an environment um, that, that's really being, you know, and ultimately a gateway to do that. And the thing that, you know, that I'm just so excited about is agents are the ones that own the relationships and to be able to empower the agent that to, to communicate this and then, you know, go out, really ultimately elevate their relationships with their consumers and their past clients. It's a game changer for them. And that's, a, that's the part that, again, I think is just, we're so passionate about at, at Zoodelio. 
Yep. Love it, dude. So, so kind of same, same conversation direction, if you will, but slightly different topic. What do you, you know, a lot of people are concerned with, and, and the reason I want to ask you is, is, I mean, you, you know, a lot about this space, you deal with a lot of lenders, you guys have big, you know, you work with all these big institutions and so forth. You know, what, what, what is, what is your prediction when it comes to mortgage rates here, mm. you know, in, in the next, I mean, even, I know it's very, this is very difficult and I don't know anybody that can predict this. So I'm yep. just kind of asking your own personal two cents, you know, yep. uh, um, of, of where you see it, at least. Maybe it's harder to predict beyond this year in 2022, but where, where do you predict, you know, these being? I think that they're going to go. I mean, they obviously are going up. They've already said that they're going to go up. I mean, I think we could see in a year. I, I think that they're going to test it. That's, that's my honest answer. Um, we all know that that was like mm -hmm. the number one thing that ended the crisis before was actually the cost of money, right? Well, like, you, you know, that's one, the one thing that steered us out of the crap that we were in before um was really ultimately the cost of the money the thing that's driving a lot of the oh, this you know making these six hundred thousand dollar starter homes here in the phoenix metro affordable is the cost of money and if that cost of money does not line up with the um you know the the socioeconomic class of that particular neighborhood i think that, it, that we could see some rejection right? Meaning that the consumer is obviously going to do that. And that's a metric that they're going to look to control. It is about the supply and demand. And we don't want to see, you know, th those types of things happen, but we also haven't seen, you know, a lot of houses hit the market. So, I mean, it's it, like I said, it, it, it still comes back down to supply and demand. And I, for one, you know, with the bond market and, you know, fed and all of those types of things, um, clearly they, they have to, it can't sustain that. We can't keep artificially, buying bonds, you know, which obviously directly uh, relates to, to, to interest rates, et cetera, um, to, to, to keep it false low. I mean, there has to be a shift. So, I mean, to answer your question directly, I think it could go up a whole percent in, in, in a year. I really do. And then, and then see where it graduates from there. I think that they'll really see what happens if they were to add a full percent on. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, we know, I mean, for a solid buyer, let's just say, you know, 1% interest rates is about 10% of, of purchase power. It, it right. impacts. And, you know, um, but you know, what blows my mind, dude is, okay. It goes up 1%. So as of today, what's a 30 year fix, like 3.6. So, you know, whatever. Silly low. Yeah. It's yeah. Silly so low. it goes up to 4.6, dude. Like when you and I were in the game, dude, it was like 5% first and anywhere oh. from like up to like 11% on the second, you know, as when they're doing. Oh the Yeah. You know, and, and, um, and, you know, I have a lot of mentors in this business that were back in the seventies and yep. 80s when interest rates were, you know, hitting close to 20%, 18%, yep. Yep. you know, back in the day, you could go open a CD and get 20% of your money. I know that's crazy. You know, um, you know, so, I mean, money is still insanely low, even yeah. if it goes to, to, you know, 5%, I mean, it's still stupid fucking low. Yep. And, you know, it, I know that people don't want to go through the pain that it's going to take to, to go through the, you know, correction, slow down, whatever you want to call it, but it's, it's needed. Well, the, uh, the other thing too, to really look at, right. So, I mean, it, you know, when you, and this is a little bit obviously deeper, you know, in math and what, whatnot, but when you look at inflation, the way that it's happened, yes, the inflated of inflation of prices have happened, but the inflation on cost of money in this arena has not happened. And that's another dynamic when we look at it. Okay. Well, you know, I, I got my 16 year old son who's, you know, his first job is $16 an hour. And I'm like, this is ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous. I still, I'm sorry, I'm 42 years old and it still bothers me, but <laughs> like $16 an hour for your start first job. That's crazy. Anyway, my point is, is, in, you know, now you have, let's just say, you know, the, your average household income that is now gone up, you know, 10, 20%, you haven't seen, the rates do those same type of things. Yes, it's, it's, so that's where I think we're going to see this balancing act. And that's what I'm talking about is, you know, some of these powers that be, yes, prices have gone up, but the cost of capital has not. And so as they adjust this, you know, especially when you're talking about people that, you know, maybe they are super equity rich. And I think we're just, we're, we're, we're going to see a lot of really interesting things right now. And you're seeing a lot of people upgrade and do, um, you know, because of cost of capital is cheap. You know, they live in that, um, that yeah, again, we'll go back to our days. They bought the house in 2012 that for 250 and that dang house just sell is selling for 600 grand now. 
right? And now they're taking that same type of equity, socking it down. They don't have MI, you know, there's, there, you know, they can actually even buy down a rate. There's all kinds of certain things that they could do because they, because now they're cash rich that changes, you know, the payment schedule on that circumstance. So again, you know, take what I would say for agents to take, to take out of this is realize that there's a lot of opportunity when you have this type of, you know, cash and, or even lenders that are, that are listening to this, of course, you know, you have these different metrics and you have the ability in this circumstance to, to really look at, uh, or I guess really ultimately perform in a fiduciary fashion, right? That's one of my, my biggest things in these circumstances is being able to, to look at what's, what's the, what's the dynamic? Is it price? Is it interest rate? And I think it's, it's, I don't know if it's, it's a chicken or the egg conversation, I, I, I think. And, and so that's where, Again, the rates obviously have to go up. We cannot, as a as as an economy, keep infusing capital in the bond market the way that we have been. Yeah, yeah, it'll be. I mean, and, and what what I don't want to say makes me nervous. You know, I mean, the pendulums always you know swing back and forth and eventually end up at baseline, um, which we know. You know, if you look at real estate nationwide, you know, we're about 40% above baseline. You look at the stock market, about 57% bond markets beyond that. I mean, some point it's going to swing and, yep. and, and, you know, but one thing that people don't think about, which is a very viable option is that inflation, let's just say inflation continues at 7% year over year, you know, yep. for, for the next 10 years, but then real estate could appreciate then at, let's just say 2%, which I think Redfin just adjusted their long-term prediction to about that. Um, and, and, you know, whether they're right, wrong, I don't know, but let, let's just say that that happens, you know, just hypothetically. So 7% on the CPI inflation, you know, for the next 10 years, but then real estate appreciating at a 2%. So a, a massive slowdown, but still growing. So we're not talking about, you yeah. know, losing value. It's still growing. So, so, you know, um, uh, but then when we, oh, and that's it continues for 10 years. Well, that, is a 50% correction in the real estate market over 10 years, even though both went up. So yep. that's a very viable option too. A lot of people yep. think that it's got to be a crash, you know, right. Or, no. you know, it, it, you can have a, a, a big ass correction without having a hardcore real estate market crash. And, um, you know, and, and now with the fed, not talking about just purchasing less assets, but liquidating it, liquidating the balance sheet. And that's why you're seeing interest rates peak up now without even, you know, without tapering even taking place, nope. but Wall Street sets interest rates on, on mortgage, you know, on, on mortgages. So yeah, it's you know, gonna, there's going to be some volatility there, you know? Um, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting times, man. And it's, it's, it's going to be a fun it, ride, man. That's all it, I can say. it will. And, and honestly, like, so my, my summary of everything that we just, you know, kind of dissected here, and this is, this is my opinion. I think that there's one thing that the, you know, the 08, you know, Oh, well, oh, seven plus, you know, plus crash, um, really did is it taught them how to, to steer out of it. I mean that, so, I mean, and I'm talking about, you know, obviously, you know, the type of capital they can, they can control economic turns. And so, um, that's the part I am talking about clearly some of this institution money that we're talking about. And, and so I don't think that there's going to be a crash, you know, you know, I know there's a lot of doom and gloom around a lot of this type of stuff. I think it is going to be just a simple taper off. I don't think we're going to see the the major equity appreciation. I think it's going to be more of that, you know, balance type environment, unless, you know, some unforeseen thing happens that, that we don't know of. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, that's I, my I opinion. Yeah. And I agree with you, dude. Uh, well, when I say that there, there, there are things that are out of, out of control, but, um, and what I mean, I mean, if, if you look at every central bank, throughout the globe will do anything they possibly can to fight off a deflationary depression, you know, because our monetary okay. system, the fractional banking system is, it, it, it's based off of debt. You can't, can't go into a, a deflationary environment without nope. it collapsing the whole entire monetary system, you know? Um, uh, it, it, so they would rather have inflation versus deflation, you know, for sustained periods of time. But what a lot of people don't realize, even when I speak to financial advisors, they, they don't, they don't have, uh, most don't have education on this, but one brilliant move that the, the central banks here in the U.S. did is with swap lines. So mm -hmm. we've now become essentially the actual central bank for almost every major country out there and every emerging country out there with via swap lines. So that's why you're seeing even though, yeah, we're having inflation take place and our dollar is, is having less purchase power here in the United States, the U.S. dollar keeps gaining in strength 
because of, of this brilliant move of swap lines, dude. Um, uh, and yeah, I just, I see our dollar bill keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. It may mean that we might be in for some difficult times yeah. is, is, is living here in the U S because I mean, if you like, if right. you look at the federal government as a business and, and if we're in their shoes, yeah, right, dude, if you can manage the strength and keep, you know, keep, keep currency strength globally, but then put yourself into an inflationary, let's just say a decade inflationary environment like you did in the 70s, that would then allow you to be able to inflate, not completely out of, but you'd be able to flip around the debt crisis that our federal government has by, by doing yeah. exactly that, you know, so you know, and, and the, I don't think it pull it off or not. And I don't know if that is, this is intentional or I, I, I don't know how yeah. it's not, but I agree with you of, of like, look, we're, we don't, to me, most likely, unless there's something insane, like yeah, yeah. getting a world war three with fucking yeah. China or Russia yeah. or have civil war here is this like, unless there's something crazy, um, like, major unforeseen. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. I, you know, I think we're going to have a, a decade or two of, you know, kind of an inflationary environment here. Um, uh, and inflation, I don't know how it can't continue, especially with the supply chain. There's no, no fix that's taking place. So there is no, there's no fix this inflationary yeah. environment, you know, uh, but the dollar bill is going to continue to gain strength. I don't see any way of that reversing either, you know, so, you know, long-term we're going to be in a great spot as a country. We just might have to go through a little bit of pain, you know, for the average person, when I say the average person, it's because the average person is, they're so over leveraged in their own life, you know, it, so true. you know, we got it, we got it, but this will be good, you know, in that, you know, just like, okay, COVID sucked that COVID happened, but it also was great for, I mean, at least I look at my own life, like it, number one, it made me refocus on health and take health and oh, yeah. a whole new different level. It also made me reprioritize just where my life was going and what I was doing with things. And, you know, it's a shitty thing, but like good can come out of bad, you know? So I think that this next environment will be very tough for a lot of people, meaning that, Hey, look, I mean, you don't need the $50,000 upgraded shower, you know, or, or yeah. whatever it may be. Like we buy so much stupid shit. That's just yeah. shit. You know, it's going to force us back into the basics, back into the fundamentals and, and, you know, restore some of those good financial fiscal values. Which isn't a bad thing. Like you said, right? Like, I mean, it's, you know, people resist change, like we've talked about, but it's in, as, as we've stated a couple of times, the only, you know, one of the few things that are certain is change. Yeah. So yeah. awesome. Well, Ali, I know we're going long on time here and I'll have all your information below, Zudillo's information, but just in case somebody's driving they're, they're you know, can't click on a link, um, best place to learn more about you, Zudilio, all of that. What, what's the best place to do that at? Um, yeah, just go to zudilio.com. Um, on there, you can um, do a demo, like uh, as far as request a cash offer, we'll see what the homeowner would see, you know, kind of get that experience for you, for what your clients would get. Of course, we have, you know, you know, some other videos on there, how Zudilio works, what is Zudilio, the power of the platform. Of course, um, we will, you know, myself, one of our, some of our sales, sales staff, support staff, we can reach out to you, give you demos, you know, all those types of things. Um, you know, anything and everything you want to be able to really investigate this type of thing to make sure Zudilio fits in your business. That's one of the biggest things I, you know, I talk about is, that Zudilio is an insertion into your business to empower your business. That's the, the you know, the key mission in this. Um, you know, we have everything you need to, to see if it's a fit for you. Awesome stuff. And uh, anybody watching, listen, there'll be a link right below for you to go click, check that out. Highly recommend that you do. Like I said, this has been a big, big game changer for our business during these times and not just during these times of COVID. Like, I, I mean, you've heard throughout this whole podcast of, I, I just see this gaining strength and gaining strength and gaining strength. And, you know, luckily Elliot and I are in the same market, you know, so I'm able to bring him in and yeah. train my agents on this stuff. But it's, it's a, I, I just highly recommend, you know, for me to you guys that you check into it because it, it's, it can massively help you grow your business. Well, that, that is the, that is the one cool thing. And I mean, I, I absolutely thanks to, to you and some of, some of your, your shout outs at times we've literally in, you know, what's it been 13 months gone from zero to about working with over 3000 agents. So it's been, it's been a pretty cool ride. Yep. Awesome stuff. All right, you guys. Well, I truly appreciate you watching. Listen, as always, thank you for your support. Go check out Zudilio. Thank you, Elliot, for being thank here with you. us. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Peace. Later.